Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cap and Gown. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources. And I'm joined today by Matt Boisvert, our president. Hey, Matt. Hi, Rachel. Great to be with you. You know, I had to do a video for my class the other day and I had to introduce myself. And I said, I'm Rachel Phillips Buck. But then I didn't have a title after that. And I just felt like it was like, <laughs> just felt strange. <clears throat> you need a you need a title for Student your class. Ordinaire. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, I'll start saying. It's good. Um, well, thank you guys for joining us. Super excited to be able to spend time with you, whether you're joining us on LinkedIn or YouTube or you are. I, did you hear I said YouTube? I said YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Don't join us on YouTube. Join us on YouTube. <laughs> Is that um, a little Minnesota coming out? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of you listen to us as a podcast, which I appreciate that, um, taking some time out of your day to think about things, all things higher education. I am excited because our theme for the year is curiosity. Don't forget. This is one of my favorite themes, actually. Yeah, it's great. Whoever came up with that was a genius. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> um, so in the vein of curiosity, today we are talking about the book that we are working on this semester. It's called Seek. Um, what is it called, Matt? My, Seek. Well, yeah, my book cover just popped off. Seek, how curiosity can transform your life and change the world. And you know what I was thinking earlier, Rachel, is, is really this is practical. It isn't just great for your work. It's really good for your life. So it's great. It's for great sure. read. Um, okay, let's do your tri- your curiosity trivia first. So do you have an interesting something for us from you your do. book? So I'm sure you were going to ask for me to tell about watching the SpaceX launch, but no, but no, but this is related to oh. space. So yeah. this is from Brain Candy. This is a National Geographic, a book, just curious things to, to know. And you told me I had to pick one. And so here you go, because I think that I get a two for on oh. this. But in, in 1965, an American astronaut smuggled a corned beef sandwich aboard a space flight. Wow. Yeah. Also, they don't allow you to have bread on this on uh, this international space station because Crumb. it can get an, it can get an crumbs can get an astronaut's eyes. Yeah. Corned beef sandwich. I appreciate the corned beef sandwich. That is a thing that I would be willing to smuggle if I were going (laughs) to space. I just cooked corned beef for St. Patrick's Day on Sunday. Right. I haven't done that in a very long time, but you know, Texas, I mean, it's brisket. It's just in Texas, they smoke it. In Manhattan, they boil it. Boil it. It was delicious. It was really good. Okay. I, um, in an invitation into our brain, have my four things I Googled in the last week. The first one is subi sauce, oh. which is onions, butters, butter, and cream, which that sounds delicious. I'm going to have to make some of that. I also Googled Irish Eyes lyrics, which do you know the song Irish Eyes? I don't. It is a great song that my daughter has learned how to sing and she walks around the house singing it. It's a oh. it's super fun. So look that up. It's a great song. Also, I googled Dave Matthews Luther College because we have a new school that we're serving, Luther College, joined our community in the last week. And my husband told me that Dave Matthews did a concert there. Sure enough, they have an album that's called Dave Matthews Live at Luther College. So that's cool. It's amazing. And then also I googled Woman Attacked by Cougar because there's an incredible story coming out of Washington Washington state about this woman who got attacked by a cougar and her friends like beat it off. And it was amazing. So you could Google that and read the whole story. All right. What have you got? Cool. Mine, my list is not as exciting. A lot of this was like, I had to catch up. Like you're such a nerd. I had to do a lot of catching up (laughs) to you, but I I did look up Noah Khan. I wanted to learn more. And I learned that he was from Vermont. Mm-hmm. So no, I looked up, this is super nerdy, SAI versus EFC. Yeah. Relevant. 
psychological sense of safety was actually a thing that I want. What well, it's hard. It's hard to find. <clears throat> um, also super nerdy. This is uh, Braden and I were talking about um, legal agreements and how sometimes you wonder if you know if an attorney just slips something in and oh, doesn't yeah. tell you. Like so, I looked up document comparison app, which there's several. I was like, hey, Braden, if this doesn't exist, we should make it because yeah, it exists. Super helpful. And then I also, oh, just four. You can do your last one. Well, I also looked up Abilene ISD Place One School Board. I'm okay. just curious about who's running. So, oh, All right. All right. Good there job. Go. Okay. Well, that brings us to the State of the Union. I really, I really hate to be a buzzkill about State of the Union starting with FASFA every time. <laughs> but here's the latest. The schools okay. are getting FASFA forms. Remember, they said in March they were going to start sending them. However, um, for example, we have uh, Fordham University. They typically receive about 100,000 ISIRs, which is how they send the information of FASFAs. They have gotten three so far. Yeah. So other schools, for example, University of Michigan has received 18. Um, University of Maryland, Baltimore County has gotten six. So this is kind of like what they did with the website. Remember where they like open right. it up and then they turned it off and they're like, it was totally it. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of what they're doing. They're like, yeah, they're coming, but like trickling in. They, they get to say crazy. that, oh, no, FAFSA, uh, it's being sent out. Right, exactly. As of March 15th, 5.8 mil million FAFSAs have been completed. Typically, about 17 million FAFSAs are completed every year. So it's about a third of what we would expect, and schools are not um, getting them. <clears throat> so it's kind of a big deal. Also, only 29% of graduating high school students submitted the FAFSA as of March 1st, which is down from 45% at the same time last year. So obviously we just, whatever, got a lot of problems and it's especially difficult for our smaller schools. Yeah, I, that, that's my big, <laughs> that's my big note. Yeah. So it is significantly affecting. So, um, you know, there's, there's always a story about a school closing um, and, and we just talked about one this morning, but if you think about these small schools that have small endowments, how significant this could be, like right now they're on the edge of, are we going to be able to stay open? Yeah, actually this article um, was talking about how April is the time where schools are setting budgets, right? Because your, your budget yeah. runs, like rolls over in June and July. So you're setting your budgets and they're like, we don't have an answer about how much the revenue is going to come in from tuition, how big our student body is going to be. We, we literally have no information about that. So really, really difficult. Um, but Matt, something else that's uh, interesting is that Louisiana has just stopped requiring FAFSA completion in high schools. So this is, I think, a mixed bag. What they're, what they're seeing about why they've stopped requiring it is that it's going to relieve students and parents from a burdensome and invasive requirement. And it's going to counter the narrative that college is the best path for everybody. So that's kind of why they're saying, okay, well, we're not going to make our high school students fill it out. But then you have all of these um, critics of it who are like, hey, there are a lot of students who that is the first domino in a step to be able to go to college to understand how much federal money you can get. You actually, if you're doing it in high school, you have somebody to guide you, right? We're creating space. We're holding time for you to be able to do it. And so critics are saying it's going to be harmful to students who normally <clears throat> wouldn't have the direction from their families to go and fill out the FAFSA. So Again, this is like everything we talk about, right, where there's unintended consequences. And it's really interesting with this stuff around FAFSA, how people are looking at the same data 
and interpret interpreting it in completely opposite ways, right? So I'm super hopeful that they do some real research around this so that we're not talking about what we think is going to happen, but actually can say this is the outcome of not having our high school students fill out fast. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that'll be interesting to see the difference between what happens in Louisiana and neighboring states. Yeah, for sure. Um, also, not surprisingly, in the uh, context of all of these schools saying, never mind, you don't have to take the SAT. So there's 1,800 uh, universities who don't require the ACT or SAT for the fall, 1,800. Um, the college board is like, hey, we made the SAT way shorter. <laughs> So instead of a three hour test, it's now a two hour test. You're not doing it with paper and pencil anymore. You can actually do it on your own computer. The writing sections are shorter. You can bring your own calculator. They basically are trying to modernize the test taking experience so that schools, schools and students would be like, okay, it's not that overwhelming. Come in, take this test online, two hours. It's just a different experience than your bubble filling. So I, I mean, that's a good pivot, I guess. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Responsive. Yeah. So Elizabeth Davis is the president of Furman University. I'm super impressed with what she is doing on that campus. She has, first of all, her vision for that campus is basically, hey, you guys, students don't understand the difference between academic affairs and student development. Like that is not a thing that makes sense in their brain. And there's no good reason for us to continue to act like those things are separate. We are going to be holistic. So, you know, I love that. Yeah, we're all over that. Yeah. Um, she was trying to figure out a way to give her students tools to understand what things they had available on campus. So like what support services are there and what do we offer on this campus, but also to make sure that we are telling our students exactly what they need when they need it by a trusted circle of faculty and staff members, which you know, I love that too. That's well, what we have know, clients. I as you say that i can just put the little service blueprinting out like hey here's and here's the little emoji of how they'll be feeling when they right. hit this wall right. so she also i really appreciate that she's like it's not fair that sometimes our students hit the advisor lottery and sometimes they miss and you and i know that from <laughs> an institution like i would have students who i'm not their advisor but I'm a great advisor. So they would come to me and we would work through their schedule and then they would go tell their advisor, hey, this is what I want to do. Right. It's just right. not it's uneven advising. It's not fair. So she created a program. She piloted it for five years. Every first year student is grouped into a cohort of 12. They meet for an hour once a week for two years, the first two years of their college career. They're meeting with the same person, a dedicated advisor, to discuss different lesson plans, but they're tied to the timeline in college, which you know we talk about the rhythm of the academic year. For example, first-year students discuss conflict resolution five to six weeks into the semester, <laughs> and roommates historically <clears throat> a little bit of friction, like the fun yeah, is worn off and we're having a little bit of conflict. So I love it. I think it's really, really smart. I think it's an innovative way to translate what is in some cases an archaic like educational architecture into what actually happens on a campus for students. So I think that that's pretty Well, exciting. and I think I not to jump ahead but but as we dive into the dive model and I mean it's clear that that as she's pursuing like how, what is the student experience let's be curious about these things yeah. and really break down a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today the things that you need to detach from and faculty i think sometimes that's just hard you know yeah. so what she's what she's doing is remarkable i like i like that she's experimenting and and it's not like a forced rollout but she really she really um yeah. yeah, it was measured in how she, she released that. This next article that I have, I'm not sure that it's 
worth reading. I mean, it's interesting. It's about four factors of college student belonging. Um, there was a research study that was like, hey, we want to understand how a sense of belonging looks different depending on your gender or ethnicity or the size of your college, those sorts of things. So you can read it. It's I don't think there's anything green. What? Is, is this the one that's about where extroverts? No. Feel like, the, okay. Side note, there was also a study that was like, hey, extroverts who are agreeable have a higher sense of belonging on our campuses. <laughs> Okay. But anyway, yeah. this All article, right. what I really love about it is two things I want to call out. The first is I've never heard of this before. There is a scale that comes out of Stanford that is called the sense of social fit, the SSF scale, which you were saying that you had Googled. It is a set of questions. I think it's maybe 15 questions, 17 questions that try to assess how a student understands their fit on a campus. Um, and it's free. So you can just actually Google it, go to the Stanford website. It's like, here's why you should use it. Here's all of the questions. Here's how you score it. I think it would be super helpful to give to your freshmen. Um, this is talking specifically around four things that they highlighted that um, we can see have a, a distinct um, impact on students' uh, sense of belonging identification with the institution, social match, social acceptance, and cultural capital. And I want to talk about cultural capital for just a minute because they've included the questions that assess for that. Here they are, Matt. It's, uh, they would say like, um, I think it's a Likert scale, right? So one to five. Yeah. Other people understand more than I do about what's going on at school. It's a mystery to me how school works. I know how to do well at school. I do not know what I would need to do to make school professors like me. And if I wanted to, I could potentially do very well at school. So I really love those. I think each of those pieces, there's a conversation to have with your students about what that means, about how we can, can grow your capital, how you can leverage it. But I love going through each of those questions and some of the other ones and just saying, how would we teach our students how to fit in at school or know what kind of people your professors are, those sorts of things, right? Yeah, very cool. So I want to kind of put a pin on that because I want to talk about it later when we get into our curiosity book. I think there are some things in the sense of belonging that we can talk about in terms of like assumptions and bias and all of that kind of stuff. So um, the last one that I have for you is there is a brand new, it's not really brand new. This is how it goes. It's like old people are like, it's brand new. And college students are like, it's been around forever. Where have you been? It is a <laughs> new um, app. It's called Side Chat. This is similar to Yik Yak, which you remember Yik Yak was a really big thing like in the, I don't know when, what, wait a minute, I have it. 2014. And then in 2017, it had a lot of problems because there was a, like a lot of hate speech on it and it was like out of control and schools really hated it. And so it closed down. And then in 2022, Side Chat came out. It's been growing in popularity. They now have bought Yik Yak and it's actually the exact same thing. So if you go to the app store and you download Yik Yak and you download Side Chat, exact same thing, right? Um, they're in trouble right now because there's a lot of hate speech going on on that app. And this gets at the questions, which I think schools are gonna have to figure out what to do in terms of on an anonymous app, can students violate real life policies of schools they attend? Should colleges do more to prevent students from virtually and anonymously violating campus rules? And if yes, and universities could monitor what students are saying, how is that then an anonymous app, right? So just there's just yeah. a lot of questions about it. And I don't think since 2014, anyone has solved the problems. This just is like a circular, circular thing where it's like, hey, people are anonymous. They're saying things they shouldn't be saying. And at the same time, is the school responsible for that? I would be curious. This is a very important question. We know this as we, we've talked about it in terms of um, stolen focus, but how do they monetize? How, how is side chat generating revenue, right? 
And and so if they're to your question about like, are you anonymous? But also, um, what is what is the data that that they're selling? If it's yeah, that I is a think, good question. I don't think they're really. I, I don't know. Maybe they're selling ads, but they're really selling data. It seems. Yeah, we'll have to do some more research about that. I don't see it in the article, but um, it is an important <clears throat> question. Um, all right. Well, that is the State of the Union, which means we get to dive into our curiosity book. See what I did there? <laughs> um, dive is actually the way this author is going to help us walk through um, increasing and cultivating our, our curiosity. So I want to remind you that last time we talked about this book, we talked about speed bumps of curiosity and a huge speed bump to curiosity is fear. Fear about rejection, about pain, about failure, fear of the unknown, fear of change, right? All of those fears that come up. Um, and I want to make a case today that we need to create a sense of safety with our students in order to teach them this dive technique to then become more curious. So I want to set this up with, let's talk about a little bit more about fear and curiosity and psychological sense of safety. And then we'll start with our dive um, model. Our first, our D, which we'll talk about today is about detachment, detaching. And then Matt, what are the rest of them? We have- Intend. intend. So yeah, detach, intend, value, and embrace. So that's we'll do each of those as we go through the rest of the semester. But um, but today we're going to talk about detach. And and Rachel, as you're talking about, definitely from a like foundational <clears throat> having to address the psychological sense of safety for your students to be able to have this conversation and to be able to develop the best habits for curiosity. But it's not just for students. When I think about the our Colleagues, when we worked at a university in different meetings or rooms that you'd be in, how important it is that you're also contributing to everyone in that in that meeting. So not just for students, but for a university to be curious, to be able to do things like what what they're doing at Hope College, right? That that we can as colleagues um, come together, but foundationally that we can be safe. We can be safe to throw it at throw out ideas, safe to be able to uh, challenge things like um, assumptions, right? So not just for students, but definitely for our friends who are working uh, at the university. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's two pieces to this. I think the first piece is how we model curiosity when we're engaged when our, with our students and with our colleagues. How do we model that? And then how do we teach our students how to be that way? But it's like with anything, right? You have to practice this before you can teach somebody else to do it. And so mm -hmm. I want to talk about kind of the two, two elements of that. You know, we talked when we were talking about speed bumps to um, curiosity about fear. And Matt, I have just been reading. I kind of, my mind is a little blown. I don't, I'm not sure that I want to like unveil all of the psychological sense of safety stuff that I'm thinking about because it is so deep and rich and is giving me insights into how we engage with our students in some really profound ways that I'm like still incubating and marinating a little bit. But I want to say, you know, we talk about belonging cues. We talked about our students showing up in danger brain and we want to move them to connection brain. And this idea of a psychological sense of safety, it comes out of workplace teams where we're saying, you know, at, at a workplace, you have to be able to have new ideas, question authority, speak up when you see a mistake. And there's a lot of leadership studies around how do you create a sense of psychological safety? Because remember, the greatest fear of humans, which is so crazy, but it is true, is that we will be humiliated we will be labeled as bad somehow, we are stupid, we're a failure, we're whatever, or that we will damage our relationships. This is just hardwired into us, right? It's how we live in communities. <clears throat> we don't want to look dumb and we don't want to be stupid. Well, we don't want people to not like us. There's a huge cost to the tribe saying you're out, right? 
Right. That's like, exactly right. <laughs> so we've, so, we've done, yeah, we, we are hardwired for um, fitting in. We, that's we exactly don't want right. to be an outlier. And yeah. we dampen all of the stuff that could make us look stupid, stand out, have someone not like us, right? Our job is to, to, to not show those things. Well, there's a huge cost to that, right? This study of psychological sense of safety came out of hospitals where nurses would know a doctor was making a mistake. It was the wrong medicine. And yet, because it was not psychologically safe for them to say, hey, you're making a mistake, they would stay quiet and their patients would get sick and in some cases die. And the researcher was like, I'm trying to understand what is so costly to you that you would rather risk somebody's life than say, hey, I think you're doing the wrong thing there, right? And it is the sense of we don't want to be humiliated. We don't want to be wrong. We don't want other people to label us as troublemakers or bad or whatever. Yeah. Well, the uh, thing <clears throat> that's really profound to me about that is, you know, I have said for years and years and years, it's so important for our students to feel seen. And I'm going to, I think, moving forward, append to that. It is so important for our students to feel seen and to feel safe. Because I was thinking about Matt, you know, when I was a college student, I had my mom called the vice president of the school, who was also the mayor, and was like, right. I'm having a terrible time. Can you talk to her? And he called me on my like uh, dorm phone and was like, "Can you come to my office?" And I came in. He's like, "How are you?" And I said, "I'm great. I'm doing great. I love it here. It's going awesome, right?" Well, I was for sure seen in that moment. I was not safe. He did not do any of the things that I needed to feel psychologically safe, right? He, he didn't show up with curiosity. He didn't ask me, how's it going? He didn't say, you know, it's really common for students to have a hard time in the first school. He didn't do any of that kind of thing. So in that case, I was for sure seen, but I didn't feel the psychological sense of safety to say, I'm a failure. I actually am failing terribly and this is not going really well. So I think moving forward, we talk about we need you to be seen and we need you to be safe because for our students who are a little bit disenfranchised, they're not traditional, they're first generation student, they're a minority in the student population, their fear of being seen negatively keeps them quiet, keeps them not engaged and this book that I was reading said, you know, nobody ever, nobody has ever gotten fired for staying silent, which I think is really relevant for our students. They're like, the one thing I can't do is use my voice to advocate for myself, to say I'm confused, to say, you know, I don't know what to do because it is not a safe environment for us. So I think as practitioners, what we have to do is figure out how to give them that, that sense of safety so that they can show up in their whole self. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's good. It's interesting because I'm just thinking about if you if you take that phrase, no one was ever fired for being silent. Well, put that in a res hall, right? right. No one no one loses their roommate or, or has to find a new room uh, if they're if they're silent, yeah. right? Same within a classroom. I mean, you you think about the student who feels overwhelmed. It feels like they're like it's getting away from them, maybe, maybe, you know, like in a stats class, and and yet they're not, they're afraid to raise their hand uh, yeah. and say, "I need, I need help," <laughs> for fear of everyone, all of their peers thinking that they're incompetent. When in reality, probably half the class is lost. Yeah. Right. You know. So one of the things that we can do as we're trying to create this sense of psychological safety, and I just want to be really clear, that is not a personality like, oh, Rachel's a safe person to be around. That is actually an intentional, intentional leadership style where you are saying, I'm going to allow everybody to know it's OK for them to fail. It's OK for them to have ideas. It's OK for them to question me. That is a really important part of how we show up together, right? So first of all, we talk about setting the stage for our students. Also, I think for our colleagues, Matt, to your point, like just to yeah. say, hey, sometimes we're going to fail. Sometimes we're going to look at a thing we did and be like, that was a let's never do that again. That was terrible. Right. Um, but setting up the expectations for failure and uncertainty to say, of course, you're not going to do well in your first test. Of course, you're going to have difficulty, you know, in your first couple of semesters as you're acclimating. 
when we set the expectation that you're not weird because that's happening, like the president of Furman is like, hey, this is the time where you need to practice conflict resolution because of course you're having conflict with your roommates. That's what you can expect. That's not a failure. That's how you're growing as a person. Yeah. So setting that up. And the other thing I want to say about setting the stage to create a safe place for students is that you want to emphasize what is at stake. So when you say to a nurse, hey, nurse, here are your choices. You feel embarrassed because you called somebody on something they shouldn't have been doing or a patient dies. Right. When you set up the stakes like this, it's much more likely that the nurse is going to be like, OK, well, I guess I'm just going to do what I need to do because I, I they are really high stakes. And I think for students saying, hey, the stakes are you don't speak up and you're not embarrassed or you're completely lost in class or you don't know how to register or you don't know how to get your financial aid or you don't whatever the thing is setting up those stakes to say this thing is actually a small drop in the bucket compared to this much bigger thing um, and asking them. It's really funny, Matt, when you and I were talking about Gary uh, earlier, the VP who asked me questions and you're like, yeah, but why didn't you tell him you weren't doing a good job? And I was like, Cause, well, because I didn't want him to know. And the right question is, what are you afraid he would know about you? Why yeah. didn't you tell him? Well, I was afraid he would know I'm a failure. I'm doing a terrible job. I have no friends. I'm depressed, right? I was afraid he would know those things. And so articulating that and then being like, Do, can you show up in that vulnerability and just say, "I, yes, this is hard for me instead of being miserable for two semesters because I didn't know how to ask for help, right? So I love our right. For our students, and just to say, what are you afraid a teacher is going to think about you if you raise your hand and say, "I don't understand what you said"? Well, you, I think you taught me the uh, what's the worst that can happen if so. Yeah. What if? Yeah. What's the worst thing that can happen? Let's just yeah. let's just be in that for a second and realize that's not so bad. And we're going to talk about this in a minute, but there is ways for you to help your students and for you internally to test that. Right. That when you show up in a place of vulnerability and you're afraid everyone's going to laugh at you and point the finger, there are ways for you to test that and then build up your confidence in what you're doing. Um, OK, so you set the stage for psychological safety. You invite participation, which this is where curiosity comes in for me. We have talked a lot about things like not registered um, students who are not registered. Right. And just assuming, you know, why they're not registered. And you have to show up with curiosity about that. You have to wonder why did they not register? You have to ask them questions about that. Um, students who are in academic recovery, we know it's because you don't know how to study. No, that's not showing up with hum humility. And it's not asking questions and really giving them the opportunity to unpack that for you. So being able to say, help me understand how this happened. Help me understand what you're afraid of. Help me understand why you didn't speak up in that case models for them this authentic curiosity where I don't assume that I know what's the best thing for you or what your experience <clears throat> is, right? Rachel, do you see that? So we have a number of schools that um, do a, a lot of non-cognitive assessments with their students, like like the one that you just mentioned earlier. But like when students say they they have a high desire to transfer at the end of the year, like isn't instead of just coming to them and, and being like, so you're planning on transferring, just asking questions around that, right? Being being curious and, and modeling that, but but also being safe in that. Don't you see that as a great example of where our schools could start to apply this? Like, hey, when we have a student who indicated a strong desire to transfer at the end of the year, how do we approach that? Well, I, I, yes, for sure. I think that's a great example. And I would just say the artfulness of the question is also part of how we set the stage for safety. So if somebody I don't know shows up and is like, hey, so you don't want to be here, right? I don't, who are you? Why are you coming at me like that, right? Yeah. Um, which is why we talk about leverage 
leverage your relationships because those are safe relationships. And if somebody who is invested in you and cares about you comes up and says, how's it going? When you imagine next semester, how will that be for you? What do you think about your major? What are the things that are making it difficult for you to be successful here? The art of those kinds of questions. And also, this is at the top of my mind because I'm trying to teach my daughter this, the timing of those questions, the picking the right moment to ask the questions about something that's really hard um, and protecting that your student or your colleagues um, vulnerability. So I think I've told you before about there's a really great counselor who would do, he would have people come up on stage and he would talk to them about different things. And one time he had somebody come up on stage and he asked this person a question and the way the person responded, the counselor was then like, you know what? I don't actually think that I'm probably going to be able to be very helpful to you. I think you probably have it together. And so he sent him back, he sent him back into the audience. And then afterwards, um, they were asking him like, hey, why did you do that? And the person was like, what he saw in me was intense vulnerability. He was going down a road that he could tell I didn't want to go down. And so instead of him continuing to make a good show, he was like, hey, I'm protected. I'm safe. I'm not going to ask you questions you don't want to answer. I'm not going to uncover you in front of this entire audience, right? And and make it look like, oh, look what a great counselor is. I can uncover this. You can go and sit down. I want to protect you. That kind of carefulness about how you ask students questions, when you ask them questions, and how you guard their vulnerability, I think is incredibly important in this safe space piece. Yeah, that's wow. Okay, the last thing that I have for you in terms of setting that space is how you respond productively. Um, we can talk a lot about how you need to listen, how you want to offer help, how you want to brainstorm. But the piece I want to call out here specifically is that you acknowledge and you thank them for their vulnerability and their truth. So even in a leadership position where someone's like, hey, Rachel, I think your idea is really stupid and we for sure shouldn't do that. Creating a, a psychological sense of safety means my first response is, thank you so much for telling me that must have been really hard for you to say, I think it's a bad idea. Let me hear more about that, right? But it is, now we talk about micro expressions and we talk about how your face leaks, right? <laughs> the ability for a student to tell you a thing, to be confused, to be unhappy, to say your test is stupid, like whatever it is, that your first response has to be a genuine thank you for that feedback now let's unpack it and figure out what we need to do because they will never do it again if your response is anything other than thank you for trusting me i want to understand that better right in that moment they're waiting to see if this is a safe place and yeah. if you respond with anything other than thank you it doesn't feel like a safe space for them right i think this is where so the word that comes to my mind you've you've talked about humility but really the word uh meek comes to mind which um you know, I, years ago, I, I did a kind of a deep dive on just the word meek and what it means to be meek. And it's like, if you think of a horse and how powerful all the muscles of a horse, how powerful a horse is, and that horse could, you know, buck you, throttle you. I mean, they're, they're very strong, but the best image to me is, is how a horse will just come alongside and, and be gentle, even though they have all this might, they, they could be. Uh, very fierce, but they're just in check. Yeah. And in that case with a student, that safety of, even though you have positional power, you have all of this authority and all, all these things and knowledge and you're, you know, you've been there before and you've seen hundreds, thousands of students before, right? To just be meek, like, hey, let's just, let's just, I'm just gonna come alongside you and not tell you yeah. all the things that you don't know, but Let's just ex explore these things together. Yeah, you've heard me talk so often about this expert expert. Hmm. And I think this is a place where we can really teach our students that, which is, yes, I have expertise. And actually, I'm very confident in what I know, right? This is not, humility is not about, well, I don't know, what should we do? That's not what we're talking about. I'm very confident in the expertise that I bring but I'm so confident in it that I know you are a whole person that I need to learn about and understand better. 
And I'm not going to just assume that I know you, that I'm actually going to stay really still and open up this opportunity for you to tell me your story and who you are and what you need from me. So I really love that. Um, So it dovetails beautifully then into this first piece of the dive uh, approach for curiosity, which is about um, the need for you to detach. And in this book, he tells a really great story about how if you think of a teacup that is poured to overflowing, when we hold on to things like assumptions and biases and certainty, all of the things that we just know are true about everybody, we have no space in our cup to learn or to be curious or to receive from anyone else. We are just brim to the brim full with all of the truths that we know. And this book really talks about what you have to do is you have to empty some of that stuff out. You've got to get rid of some of the tea in your teacup so that you have capacity then to wonder about Mm -hmm. people's experiences and to to listen to the stories that they're trying to tell you. And he talks about that in terms of assumptions, biases, and certainties, that those are the things that are going to fill up your teacup so full that you cannot listen and be curious about things, which I love. And also... I think it's super helpful to think about curiosity as a discipline that when we are going to meet our students or when we're talking to our colleagues, that we are disciplined to say, let me take out some of these things that are filling me up and come in with a posture of calmness and wonder and interest. It is a discipline. There are things that... (laughs) Matt, you and I sit next to each other. There are things that you say, and I'm like, well, that's dumb, (laughs) right? But if I came in with a like, hey, if you said, hey, I have something interesting to tell you, and I'm like, okay, get in my curiosity place, that's a totally different exchange. Tell me why you think that. I'm really curious about how you came to that conclusion, right? Those kinds of things. So I love that as a discipline. And a lot of times it's not that I believe a thing. It's it's that I heard a thing, and and I just want to bring it to your attention, too. Yeah, for sure. I would just say, to to be very clear, you don't say dumb things. I would say coming in a posture of people in general are not stupid and they do have reasons for the things they're saying. And I've told you before, like I will watch an exchange between between two people and I'll be like, I don't under, I have 57 questions about what just happened there. I want to understand this. And why did you say this? And what did that mean to you? And why? Right. And so coming to our students with a posture of everything makes sense in context. And I'm just trying to understand what the context is. That is the right way to show up in a curious, uh, curious space. So he talks about assumptions, beliefs and certainty. These are things that we hold as true without proof. And I want to underline, because I think it would be really helpful to teach our students, as well as for us to remember, that assumptions, biases, and certainties are all safety behaviors. They're safety measures. They're ways that we quickly in our brain categorize information, say what we know about it, and then make decisions. And there's some cases where that's helpful right? Like that's a, that is a safety mechanism in our brain that I can't take 20 minutes to calculate the speed of the train and how big the train is and how close I am and all of that, that I have this understanding of like, that's big and it's going to kill me. I got to move. Right. Um, so there, there are reasons why our brain does that. It really is a short shortcut in a lot of cases, but with people, we we got to be careful. Well, it's tricky because it is our tribal brain, right? So again, like all of these things, like we create these shortcuts because you're thinking about your tribe and will this, will my tribe kick me out or will they invite me in? Or is there a chance that someday I could be a leader of that tribe? But if I go outside of these, uh, you know, the, the tribal norms or all of those shortcuts that have been kind of part of part of this uh, microculture, right? Um, that that is then uh, taking risk, right. and what what you're saying is you actually have to. That's fine. Recognize them, set them over here, and just test them, right? And I love I love what the author what he talks about is just a lot of pressure testing. Like you you need to do take a thing and just add some pressure to it. 
learn how to test your assumptions, the, the things that um, a lot of times, you know, it, it really does hold you back from exploration because, well, I, if I explore, the tribe might kick, kick me out. So. Yeah, I, I think what you just said is a great example, too, of the curiosity discipline, because it is that you are setting that you are articulating what are your assumptions? What are your biases? Where are you certain? You have to articulate that. I'm sure my sister isn't calling me because she's mad at me. I'm sure that that's true. Well, Rachel, OK, if that's your assumption and you've articulated it, how then would we go through and test that? How would we make sure that that's either true or not? And I think the we talk about assumptions or testing in terms of like small and modest test of assumptions, which we can do with our colleagues. I feel like this person thinks I'm stupid. Let me do a little <laughs> test of that, right? Um, but also I think we can teach our students how to do this and test their belongingness. So how, okay, you don't wanna ask a question in the middle of class. Could you test whether or not your faculty member likes you by after class going up and saying, hey, I was confused about this thing and just see how they respond to that. And when they, cross your fingers, respond with, oh, well, let me put that on the whiteboard for you. Let me explain that to you, right? Yeah. Then there's a place where you know that assumption that you had was not true. And then we can do another test and then we can do another test and another test. Um, I was thinking mad about, I had a statistics teacher who I went to his office because I was super confused about something and he explained it on the whiteboard. And he's like, did you understand that? And I'm like, yeah, why? Because I did not feel psychologically safe. I'm like, he's going to think I'm stupid. He's going to think I'm a failure. Like I shouldn't be in this major, all of this kind of stuff. And he looked at my face and said, Rachel, you didn't understand it. Let's do it again. So he did it again for me. And then he said, do you understand it? Let's do it again. He did it three times and never made me feel stupid. That's yeah. what we're talking about, right? That kind of reality testing means that from then on, whenever I was confused about something in statistics, I raised my hand and I said, I don't understand what you, what you just said. And he said, great, let's do it again. Right. So that idea of testing that out and him being present enough to say, this is a safe place for you to say, I don't know, I'm, I'm afraid, <laughs> like I'm, I'm failing at this or whatever, I think was really, really powerful. Testing, assumption testing. Um, okay, so also we talk about in this idea of assumption testing, always coming back and re-evaluating what we assumed, how we tested it, what the outcome was, and how we're going to adjust our assumption or our bias. So it's okay for you to do these tests, but you want with your students and with yourself as well to be like, wow, that totally didn't go the way that I thought it was going to go. What did I learn? What mistakes did I make? And what do I think is true now? My faculty really are invested in my success. I do belong here. They, people do want me to come to their parties. My roommate does like me and want to go to the bean with me, right? The helping your students then reassess those assumptions is a really important part of this process. And as you talk about modeling, I think it one action item, I, I'm just thinking through uh, for me, and, and I'm thinking about when I was working at a university, all the assumptions that I'd walk into a room with, and it would be, I think, really helpful to just start writing. Like, so I just made a list of, if I wanted to do some pressure tests on assumptions of regarding a, a specific student group, like, this is a student group that's just out to get administration. They're just, you know, they're just mad all the time, whatever. Um, or financial aid. Like, let's let's talk to counselors about some of the assumptions that we've made about students who don't pay their bill, right? Like, what are, what are some of the assumptions in that? Or enrollment management and some assumptions that are made because this is the class that they brought in. What well. We, instead of making assumptions, we could have good conversation. Um, just thinking about faculty meetings and so, so many assumptions going in to those meetings. And then the last one that I had, but we could just keep making a long list, but thinking about athletics and coaches and the how they view the 
the um, perspective of student athlete, right? And and that balance and there's just a whole lot of assumptions that when you start writing these things down for each one of those, I could just, you know, um, not that I that I mean to, but I've just acquired a lot of assumptions that yeah. I need to make. And like Mark Bowden says, take that and you set it on the shelf. And and now let's just approach it with with curiosity of now I want to ask questions to really understand. Am, am I right in my assumption or was all of that made up in my head? Yeah, and I think part of the way that we can get more curious besides emptying our teacup a little bit, besides coming in and saying, I want to do some testing is in, in some of that testing, we talk about a charitable reading, right? Pretend like there's some way to understand this that is going to make sense and is not going to be crazy town. I show up in my staff meetings um, with no, I don't do this, but I mean, if you showed up in your staff meetings with your colleagues with a charitable reading, like we're all on the same team and we all want to accomplish the same things, instead of showing up in those meetings and being like, well, you're my enemy, you hate everything I say, you never, you know, <laughs> you never want to do anything new, you find the failure in everything. But guess what? When you walk into a room like that, that's, you produce that, right? That's yeah. how you're, again, your face is leaking and everybody can tell from the way that you're talking that you've walked into a battleground without a charitable uh, reading of your colleagues or your students or however you're thinking about that. Go yeah, ahead. he has a whole section that's like, leave the mind reading to Professor X. Don't don't think that you know what someone else is thinking about you or your passion or, right? And isn't it so crazy that we would rather make those assumptions, stick to those assumptions than confront them? Because it's so scary. If I come to you and I'm like, why don't you want to go to lunch with me? And you're like, because I don't like you, Rachel, <laughs> which maybe would be my assumption. I actually would rather just assume it than have to check with you because it's really scary that you might be like, no, you're right. I actually don't like you. I don't want to spend time with you. Most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time you've made some sort of um, mistake in your assumptions. I read it, yeah. Yeah, and we for sure, we just don't want to check on it because it's so scary that it'll be confirmed. But Matt, I will also tell you that I've had times in my life where I did testing of assumptions and it turned out I it was I was right. This person really doesn't like me. This person really does think I'm stupid. <laughs> this person really does think it's my fault. And it was so helpful because then at least I have the facts in front of me. Um, Clint worked for a boss one time where she was like, you're, this is your fault. You're stupid. You've made a terrible mess of this, blah, blah, blah. And he came home and said that to me. And I was like, Clint, that's not possible. Like he's super conscientious. He doesn't make a mess of stuff. Like he's very, like, there's no way you have to go back to her and be like, Hey, what I heard you say yesterday was I'm stupid. I'm not conscientious. I've made a mess of things. Go back and say that to her so she can explain. Of course, that's not what she meant. And she said, yeah, that's exactly what I said. So we can, yeah. yeah super helpful. Thank you so much. Like I assumed maybe I was crazy when you were sending me those signals, but indeed you were saying that and I don't want to work for you anymore. So what I like about that process is then we don't waste any more time wondering whether or not your assumptions are right or wrong. We just say, yes, they're right. Yes, they're wrong. And then we move on in what is true and adapt based on what that feedback is that you get. Right. Crazy town. Um, okay, one more thing that I want to call out of this book, and that is he talks about the garden salad technique. Do you want to explain the garden salad technique? You want me to? I'm happy to. I, I think it's great. So a lot of times we, um, so he was actually talking about some research where you might look at a person and, and um, kind of attribute these different qualities to them. It, that could be totally wrong. And, and it actually makes you more in fear brain because you're, you're creating distance from this person. And instead of doing that, um, like, oh, I bet that they vote for this person. Instead of something that, that would be a hot topic to you, um, to, to look at a person and, and, you know, is this a person, do I think that they like carrots or broccoli more? Not, not do they hate carrots or do they hate broccoli, but do I think they like carrots or broccoli more? Now, if you'd asked me about strawberries, that'd probably, you know, be a problem. But when it comes to broccoli 
in cares? That's a good question. That's a it's an easy way for you to start thinking mentally, start being curious, wanting to connect with this person rather than setting up some bias against them for whatever you might be afraid of, right? So so I, I really like that idea of when you're going into, oh, I'm go I have a faculty meeting and this is a room full of curmudgeons. If you just set up and you start going around and, and I could name off some accounting faculty from my university and I'd be like, well, I wonder instead of what I might attribute to them, if instead I'm kind of making tallies, I think he actually might like the broccoli. He might yeah, be a so great guy. It's such a nice way to humanize somebody. I think yeah. about even, even to say, I'm not going to think about them like accounting faculty. I'm going to think about that's a corn guy. That's a broccoli guy. That's a carrot guy. Yeah. And what the book says is that it then puts them in the category of a person. It's a person. And so you can wonder about what they think and what they love to have for breakfast and how they do Christmas and what they think about this idea. And it gives you all of these options. It kind of takes out of your brain those safety measures, those like shortcuts that you're using and puts you into the posture of curiosity where you really can wonder about things and also find um, similarities together. Yeah. Right? We may not agree about this thing, but we may agree about these 1800 other things um, that allows us to have great conversation and be really uh, enjoy each other in a really um, powerful way. So I, I love, love it. I, I think it would be really fun for your next meeting to to just use that. Start separating yeah. people out. Start, and then you can test it. Ask them questions about. Hey, so I was wondering if you would, if I had two bowls and you had to either either broccoli or carrots, which one would you pick? That's kind of fun. Yeah. I was thinking about Very teaching good. our students that as well. So like when I would do discovery, saying to, right off the bat, I'm just going to ask you a question that helps us know something about you because the context of this is that nobody knows what they're doing with their lives. You, nobody here can pick a major. Can we just put that off to the side? Let's detach from that for just a second. And you tell me where you're from or you tell me what your favorite dinner is or what your, and then all of a sudden we just become people that have this little thing attached to us, but then we're much more broad um, than that. So I really like that. I was also thinking about this with our students. When you have distance delineators, so in other words, they're faculty, they're important somehow, that with our students, part of the ways that we can make other people on campus human is just to say, forget about the fact that they're faculty. Do they like carrots or broccoli better? What do you think? Go ask them, have a great conversation about it. And that practicing of engaging with somebody that you assume is too important for you, right? That then you go and you test that out and you go, yeah, but we had a great conversation about this thing. We might find something that we have in common, which I think is really awesome. Yeah, it's fun. So we're going to continue on with this book and think about how we can be more curious. But I do, I think the summary and the action items for us at the end of our time today is just how are you going to get rid of a little bit of tea in your cup so that you can learn and listen from others? How can you do some of that pressure testing of how we just know people are going to show up or be angry or whatever? Test that out a little bit and then go back and synthesize that and say, Actually, I was totally wrong in that case. That didn't go at all how I assumed it would go. It actually, I here's what I've learned about you. Um, and then having the posture of curiosity where you're not in trouble, you're not in danger, teaching that to our students where they can show up and wonder about how did you become a teacher? How, tell me, you know, what side of town you live on? Those kinds of things I think are really good. Um, I love the idea of putting that in like Furman's class, right? That you would have a yeah. whole section in that class about I'm going to create psychological sense of safety and then we're going to talk about your assumptions and how you're going to test them and then you're going to come back to the class and we're going to talk about what you found out about those things so I love that anything else you want to add no I'm just excited like uh so next week I have the pleasure of interviewing Rachel for cap and oh, gown what that is going to be really hard Tell me about it. Me, it's gonna be. It's oh, gonna no. be hard for you. It's gonna be I really. So. Hard. I think so. I, I don't like talking about myself. I know. I, I'm very sensitive, so it, there's a hundred percent chance I'm gonna cry. Hundred percent, at least once, maybe three times, depending. If on I do my job, 
if I <laughs> if I do a good job. I will yeah. be like, yeah, you didn't bring it. So well, that's I, sweet. Yeah, it'll be really fun because I will just say that, you know, occasionally I tell the entire story of how I have ended up where I am. Most of the time I just allude to it. Um, but there's some really powerful parts of that story. So if you are like, why is she always talking about being an at-risk student? I want to hear the whole thing. Join us next week. Yeah, so there's that. And then, but the rest of, of this book and in, in the dive model is super interesting. So um, just highly recommend uh, the book in the process, because I just going through this, I always thought I was curious, but I can see near, now where I've actually had, I've had speed bumps to my own curiosity. Yeah. Uh, this has really helped me grow in a lot of ways. So for sure. thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. Bye.